Hi, my name is Dumisa Nkomo. I'm here to take you through dividend policy decisions. And this is now part two of four. In part one, we're just discussing the different schools of thought where we would want them to continue. We had been discussing about the residual approach and continuing with the residual approach. approach would want to look at this following example. So remember the residual approach says you can only pay a dividend after having satisfied all possible investment opportunities. And looking at this example, we've got what we call a project schedule, which gives us possible investments that the company can invest in, but benchmarking on the weighted average cost of capital. So in other words, if you look at this example, you're going to find that projects A, B, C, D, E, and F will have a return that is higher than the company's work. And the company's work is 20%. So in other words, all projects that have got a return that is above 20%, the company is expected to invest in them according to the residual approach. And that leaves us with projects G and F, which we are saying these are projects that the company should not invest in because they will not increase the value of the company. And therefore, we we'll then want to ask ourselves, how much money do we have in order for us to invest in these uh, projects. So assuming that we've got a project of $1 billion, it now means that all projects A to F, we can invest in them because they would require a total of $800 million, which leaves the company with $200 million worth of or free funds to pay out as a dividend. And remember, we're saying projects G and H are not viable projects because their returns are below the company's work. However, assuming that the company is, the company's profit is 350 million, and assuming also that the company has got a debt to equity ratio of one is to one. In other words, it's 50% debt and 50% equity. Taking that into, into consideration, if the profit of the company is 350 million, then it means that all projects A to F are not going to be possible. It's not going to be possible for the company to invest in all of them. And remember, we are saying we need a total of $800 million to invest into these projects. So if we need that much money, we are now asking ourselves, how much money do we need from equity providers, which will be $400 million. And if the company's net profit or profit reserves are worth $350 million, it means that $350 million is not even enough to invest in all the projects, which doesn't give an opportunity for a dividend to be paid. And we will go back to equity providers and ask for a further 50 million in order for us to invest into these projects. And that is according to the residual approach. Now, continuing with our uh, dividend relevance and irrelevance discussions, looking at uh, Miller and Modigliani's assumptions, these two say dividends should be a passive residual, but you are going to find that sometimes companies do pay a dividend, and this is a matter of policy. And remember, a policy does not necessarily have to be based on the ability of the company to pay or the availability of funds, as we were discussing earlier on in the residual approach. But we are saying this is how the company operates it is its policy to pay a dividend, whether the company has made a profit or not. And this will have some impact that it has on the shareholders because 
as shareholders, they value that dividend more because they take it as a return on their investment. And if the company is able to pay out a dividend and a cash dividend for that matter, it sends some information to the shareholders that the company can continue to operate without that particular cash that has been paid out as a dividend. So remember, before a decision has, been, has to be made in relation to whether a dividend should be paid or not and how much should be paid, there are things that we need to consider and we are not taking into account risk management as a topic that we are linking to this. So here's a list of other or some, some of the factors that we need to consider in making uh, a dividend payment. So we're going to look at them in greater detail. The first one being legal and other requirements. And for example, what quickly comes to mind is the Companies Act. So you, you're now asking yourself, what are the requirements of the Companies Act in relation to paying a dividend? Uh, you're going to find that the company has to make sure that it has passed the solvency test and the liquidity test in order for it to comfortably pay a dividend. In other words, we are saying after having taken these cash resources out of the company, the company should be able to still continue operating without any challenges that it faces in relation to cash and solvency. In other words, we also need to make sure that the fair value of the company's assets are uh, greater than the fair value of its liabilities as well as taking into account contingent liabilities. And this is just to say in the event that all liabilities become due, are, are the company's assets fully going to cover its liabilities? And therefore, we also now need to make, make uh, this point that Dividends don't necessarily need to be paid out of retained earnings, but you can pay out them out of any other uh, equity reserve that the company has. But the bottom line is, and the important factor is, a liquidity test has to be passed first. Therefore, you also need to make sure that after having made the decision, the next question will be, do we have enough cash resources to pay this uh, dividend because normally this dividend will be in the form of cash. And you also need to take into account contractual obligations. For example, a company may have obtained some loans and included in these loans will be some clauses in relation to the company being limited uh, to pay dividends in order for the loan provider to have comfort that the interest and the principal will be repaid. So those are the, some of the things that you also need to take into, into, into consideration. And this now is an issue of you looking for information in relation to any covenants that the company may have in relation to the debt contracts that the company uh, has. And we then also need to look at the information content of dividend. Remember, we had earlier on said that the payment of a dividend sends some certain information to the shareholders that the company can still operate without that cash that has been paid out. So here we want now to emphasize this point in the sense that the moment a company pays a dividend, it signals to the shareholder that the company is operating well. In other words, we are saying the company is in a healthy state and therefore increasing a dividend for this matter sends a signal that the company's earnings are seen to be, are seen to be sustainable by management. And therefore management is actually saying that even if we increase the dividend to the shareholders, company can still be able to operate sustainably without facing any challenges in terms of its cash resources and uh, its solvents. Therefore, decreasing the dividend will also send a signal, but this signal will now be in a negative direction because if the company reduces the dividend, then the shareholders are going to, are going to, to 
to get the information that this company is no longer able to operate sustainably as it was operating before. Therefore, continuing with our uh, information content, you're going to find that this now has got an issue in relation to the shareholders trying to analyze the company's earnings and its dividend. And you're going to find issues to do with linking to financial statements analysis, for example, calculation of uh, dividend payout ratios. Those are some of the things that will then come out in relation to analyzing such information and all that is being done in order for the shareholders to try and understand the state in which the company is in relation to their dividends. But sometimes there could be other issues that may be happening in the company or in the environment in which it is operating. And remember, we're saying dividends are paid out of profits made, but these profits will not necessarily be current year profits only. They could be profits that the company has made in the past years. Um, but remember, we are saying as long as the company is able to pay a dividend, then it can pay after having satisfied the solvency and liquidity uh, test. So let's, let us take an example of a year in which a company has made a loss. So assuming that the loss is 5 million, but the company's retained earnings balance before this loan, this loss has been taken into account was 25 million, which means now that ultimately the company's net retained earnings balance will be 20 million. And we are saying in this particular case, the company can still pay a dividend or can still pay a dividend that it was paying earlier on. And as the shareholders look at the financial statements, they are going to see that a loss has been made, but we have been able to receive the same dividend that we received earlier on. And that also communicates to the shareholders that this loss that has been made is not a continuous loss that is going to be made, but it's just a temporary loss that has been made. In other words, the directors of the management team is confident that the company is going to return to profit in the, in the future. So you're going to find that other companies, even though they have recorded losses, they are still possibly going to continuously pay dividends as they used to do in the, in the previous years. Thank you very much for listening to this part two of dividend policy decisions. We are going to continue with our discussion in part three of all parts of our dividend policy decision.